All right, I'm Stephen Giannata, and I'm the chairman of uh, neurosurgery at uh, Keck USC Medical School, and, I, and I'm the training program of the neurosurgery residency at LAC USC Medical Center. You are listening to Interview with the Surgeon with the Surgeon Agent. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we welcome Dr. Stephen Giannata, chair of neurosurgery at USC. Doc, how are we doing today? We're doing very well, thank you. Thanks for being with us. So let's just jump right into it. What were your goals and aspirations during your residency? Uh, well, like many people in their residency, you're surrounded by academicians. And uh, when, when most people graduate from medical school, they have a similar aspiration, which is someday to obviously be a skilled physician, but perhaps to teach somebody else. And that has a lot to do with role modeling, uh, because unless their mom or dad was a neurosurgeon, they really don't have any other role models except for their professors in medical school. I was no different. So I wanted to be an academic neurosurgeon. And, and uh, that was sort of primary. Uh, but uh, very quickly during my residency, I got interested in vascular neurosurgery which of course is the you know, management of aneurysms and AV malformations and stroke and revascularization of the brain and so forth. That was a, at the time, this was the 70s. That was the hottest uh, subdivision or subspecialty of neurosurgery at the time. And in fact, if you look back at our major national meetings uh, and uh, our publications, the most common publications submitted and the most common abstract submitted to the meetings had to do with cerebral vascular disorder. That's no longer the case, but that's what it was back then. And so I got caught up in that. And so my two aspirations were to be a strong uh, vascular neurosurgeon and contribute to the literature and the research and also to be an academician and uh, teach neurosurgery. Can you kind of take us through your mentality heading into your first job search and how that perspective changed in the beginning years of your career? Yeah, my, uh, it's, not a, it's not a happy story, actually. Um, I knew I wanted to be in academic medicine. Um, I did make one visit, because I know this is going to be an upcoming question, and we can flesh it out a little more later. I did make one visit to a, a good friend of mine who practiced uh, uh, neurosurgery in the private practice environment in Dallas, Texas. So I made, and actually I made two of similar um, um, visits, one to uh, another former graduate of neurosurgery in Denver, Colorado. So I looked at Dallas and Denver, Colorado as potential sites to do private practice neurosurgery. Um, and early in my academic career, I looked back with some chagrin that I didn't take those, one of those two plastic surgery jobs, but that's that's part of the story and probably why you asked the question. Anyway, I had uh, actually uh, a number of uh, job opportunities if, if you, if, in terms of job openings, many of which were not appealing to me because they weren't vascular or they were starting at, um, uh, the, the, we were just uh, starting to have fellowships in neurosurgery at the time very unregulated fellowships, nothing formal. Uh, and um, when I looked at these fellowships, I would have been making the exact same pay that I was making as a chief resident at the University of Michigan. And by that time I was married and that was unacceptable. So academic medicine, I looked at um, one, two, three uh, opportunities uh, and two of them were on the West Coast and I ended up at UCLA for uh, two years. Uh, I um, made a mistake of not being uh, careful in terms of what my salary would be. Uh, and my, uh, the person that was in charge of uh, recruiting me and hiring me also didn't do his due diligence. And so my wife and I moved from Ann Arbor, Michigan to Los Angeles thinking we were gonna buy a house because of my new salary and only to find out that uh, my salary wasn't anywhere near what uh, 
it was t uh, that what, near what they told me. And so um, uh, we were in financial straits for the first six months of my, uh, my uh, first job. So if there's a lesson learned there, it's obviously dot your I's and cross your T's and do your do due diligence, uh, especially before you sign on the dotted line and especially before you sign on any dotted line where you're going to be responsible for either a house or a new car or something like that. Now, during your career, did you ever consider going private practice or were you academic focused all the way? Yeah, I was academic focused all the way. I really, um, even though um, I, but I, I realized that my uh, decision making was based on role modeling, uh, it was still uh, the right decision for me. And, and if you look back on my career, obviously it was the right decision for me. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, no, I didn't. Um, contemplate or strongly consider private practice. On the other hand, I've trained, what, uh, 70 residents over the, over the ensuing uh, 30 years. And um, I've had uh, many uh, uh, discussions on the pros and cons of uh, academic neurosurgery and private practice neurosurgery. And about 30% of our graduates go into private practice and they go in with my blessing and whatever advice I can give them about the practice environment because not everybody can be in academic neurosurgery. There's not enough academic jobs. So most people are going to end up in private practice and um, I do what I can to encourage them if I think that that's the right pathway for them. What would you say were some of the keys of your success that shaped your early career as you climbed to the top of your industry? So uh, success is, uh, uh, in, in academic medicine is predicated on uh, several parameters. One, of course, is clinical expertise. Uh, and uh, in vascular neurosurgery, um, I had to uh, build a, a vascular practice. And that meant, um, making sure my skill set was high and making sure that my patients got good care and making sure that when my patients went back to the referring physician, they were in good shape. And so that meant, um, uh, uh, that meant uh, honing my surgical skills, whether it was going to be in the operating room or whether it was going to be in the laboratory. Uh, so that was job number one. Job number two uh, was teaching. So um, uh, I had a great role model back at the University of Michigan uh, as a teacher, and I just emulated his, his um, methodology, which is basically to, you know, be very encouraging, try to let uh, the trainee have as much latitude in terms of uh, decision making and, uh, and um, developing their own skill set as, as much as possible on their own, but rescuing the situation so that there is a high degree of success when they're doing their cases. So then the third thing, of course, is research. I wasn't as very strong on bench type research in my first uh, at UCLA. Um, I had a lab and I had a, I had a research grant, but I really found that that was not uh, anywhere close to my skill set. And when I left UCLA and came to USC, uh, we had a much broader base of patients and a much larger patient load, and that lent itself to getting involved in clinical research uh, and uh, reviewing uh, case series and uh, developing surgical techniques and surgical instrumentation just because the caseload was so conducive to that. Three spheres, um, uh, I worked hard at gaining those things in the first three, three to five years of my career. And then the fourth thing that probably distinguishes me from you know, most other academic neurosurgeons was national leadership. Uh, and I was encouraged to assume roles in national neurosurgical leadership when I took my job here at USC in 1980. And by 1982 or 83, I was already on a couple of committees from the Congress of Neurological Surgeons 
which I ultimately ended up on the executive committee and I was secretary of the organization. And from that, uh, you build your network and uh, you're thrown in with other academic neurosurgeons across the country. Um, and we formed a, we formed a, a, a relatively small group of like-minded surgeons and we supported each other through the early decades of our careers and helped each other to national prominence, which is a, a strong piece of advice that I give to all of my residents who are thinking about academic neurosurgery. I say, get yourself a support group and network it and um, pull your, every time one of your colleagues gains in a, uh, in, in a role or a position, he or she reaches down and pulls you up right behind them, which is the value, of course, of the network. And that's, that's what ended up uh, helping me to, to get to uh, the uh, leadership of the national organizations that I have uh, enjoyed. What advice do you have for the graduating residents and fellows entering the professional job market for the first time? Uh, again, uh, you got to do your, do your homework. Get, get all the advice you can get. Obviously, if you're going to go into academic medicine, you've usually got a cadre of advisors and professors and uh, even the even more senior level residents that you can pick their brain. But um, nowadays, jobs are probably accessed through uh, the headhunter firms, the job search firms, academic jobs. Remember, less than a third of neurosurgeons in the country are in academic jobs. And so um, you're going to need some sort of um, help in terms of identifying those jobs. Uh, the other thing is um, one of the problems we have in California and similarly on that in the Northeast is those are two very desirable places to live and practice medicine. Uh, and, you, and, and so if you've got a major geographic constriction in where you're going to set up your first practice, then you're going to need all the help you can get in, um, in marketing yourself to these positions. And uh, there's not much you can do once you've graduated from your residency because your record is baked. Um, you, you be, you, you, you be, you've published or you haven't. You've done research or you haven't. You've spoken in national meetings or you haven't. Uh, and so that will be a major determinant whether or not you're going to get an academic job and a major determinant whether you're going to get an academic job in a, a highly competitive environment like uh, Southern California or New York City or Boston. Uh, uh, so um, uh, be wary of that as you're rising through the ranks of your residency. With the pandemic going on and a lot of these meetings being done virtually, what advice do you have for the graduating class as they continue to figure out the whole networking and outreach process? Yeah, well, uh, I'm start, I'm trying to figure it out myself. We're in the, uh, right now we're getting ready to um, uh, entertain probably 60 applications for our three residency uh, program uh, training positions. Uh, and. Normally we do that face to face with uh, with uh, interviews where where uh, resident applicants come and meet our faculty and meet our existing residents and um, gain information and look at the environment and see if they're a, ma a match for that particular style of program uh, and now we've got to do that virtually and that's a real challenge uh, so. Um, you've got to do your due diligence one way or the other. If you can't jump a jet and fly to the program and look around, uh, the next best thing is to do it virtually. Uh, and if there are programs that are appealing to you, it's, it's up to you to contact those programs, get your name uh, well uh, established there. Same thing applies when you're looking for your job when your residency is over with. Uh, you've, got to, you've got to go there. You've got to uh, interview, you've got to talk to your partners, you've got to talk to the office staff, uh, you've got to um, see if this is environment. I can, I can tell stories all day long 
uh, from some of my residents, uh, a few of them anyway, who were in uh, less than happy situations. Uh, perhaps something that could have been avoided, perhaps not. Uh, sometimes things aren't just uh, as they seem through no fault of your own. And sometimes you change your short-term or perhaps long-term goals and find out you're in the wrong situation and you got to make a switch. One of the big things in neurosurgery, uh, because it's a seven year program and because even after seven years, probably 60% of our graduates take a fellowship. Uh, so do the math. Uh, you finish medical school, you're in your mid twenties and now you're going to be in the mid to late 30s by the time you um, finish and get a job that pays a halfway decent salary, um, uh, are you going to start a family? Are you going to get married? Are you going to have a significant other? Um, if, if any of those things happen, they're, they're pretty likely to happen during the residency. Neurosurgery residency is a pretty tough place to uh, try to pull that off to have family and have children and be with them and be attentive and so on and so forth. It takes a lot of planning. It takes a, a willing partner, um, whether you're male or female. And, and remember, um, I think uh, residents, 70% uh, now of residents in the US are women in neurosurgery. Uh, and that's growing. Um, uh, our, our class uh, three years ago was all women. We took three women. That was basically unprecedented in neurosurgery. Those ladies have uh, a lot of decision making to uh, go through, but they're going to have families uh, because their obviously prime reproductive years are during their residency. Are they going to take time out of the residency? If they take too much time out, uh, they're going to have to redo part of it. Those are some really uh, important questions for people who are not necessarily neurosurgery, but for people who have a long uh, uh, training uh, program, like plastic surgery is one, cardiac surgery, although they've, they've now been able to shorten it, but it's not that short. So those long training programs, especially the ones that involve a fellowship thereafter, you've got to make a lot of life decisions, not just financial decisions, but life decisions. And then of course, you, you'll, you'll argue correctly that Life decisions are, 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 are hooked to financial decisions. They go hand in hand. So lifestyle is a big issue. Uh, and uh, neurosurgery lifestyle, especially residency, uh, conducive to, uh, to developing uh, uh, interests and hobbies and raising families outside of the residency. So that all has to be contemplated before you make that kind of decision. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.